evening, everybody. Eradicating needless blindness. Imagine blindness that's needless. Well, when I started eye surgery 20 years ago, uh, there was a lot of blindness, and most of our work was really to train us up to deal with the most common causes and have enough expertise to spot the rare causes. But something extraordinary happened in the last 20 years. And 20 years ago, there was a lot of blindness, but it wasn't all needless because we didn't have the means and technology to deal with it. So tonight I want to share with you what has got me really excited about the time that we're living in. And the fact that thanks to this extraordinary age of technology, I truly believe that we don't have to have any more needless blindness. One of the things I want you to realize is that everybody needs to have eye health, their eyes tested. If a baby doesn't have its eye disease or infection or something picked up before the age of six months, it's often too late to save the sight. If a child doesn't have their eyes examined before the age of the age of eight, one in 10 that normally has unequal vision in each eye will end up with a lazy eye. How many people in this audience has a lazy eye? Well, if you're shy, I will tell you, one in 10. So that's normal, you know? And then another 25% of the population is going to become short-sighted. And the good news is it's attached to the gene for IQ, so you can now put your hands up if you're short-sighted. <laughs> but you know, that usually presents between the ages of 9 to 14, 15. In fact, a member of the Australian government who recently passed a bill to give 25 million to prevention of blindness in the Southern Pacific told the story that he was only picked up as needing a prescription of minus eight, which is quite high myopia, when he was 14. And he just didn't know that not everybody else was unable to see what he couldn't see. So after that, now you really don't have to put your hand up here, but when you become middle-aged, you're going to need reading glasses. And that is normal. If you're not short-sighted, needing a prescription, you're definitely going to need reading glasses. And at least a few people here have bought the over-the-counter glasses for a dollar. You know, you pick them up at the airport. They're manufactured in China for a dollar. And they're all plus one to plus three. And you can give them to anybody. How easy is that? But do you realize they were not available a few years ago? What does everybody on this um, picture here have in common? Well, they're not all men. We've got President Mary Robinson, uh, High Commissioner of Human Rights, Matt McGandy, uh, Non-Resistant Resistance, Dalai Lama, Pursuit of Happiness. Uh, we could add in Desmond Tutu, other people who've signed into this Charter of Compassion. Bono, what would the world be like if these leaders, these uh, creators, didn't have access to glasses, couldn't access their education? And this is Mia, and Mia is a child who had to wear glasses since the age of four months old. And Mia could be the next President Mary Robinson, or whoever it takes to change the world, why not? And Mia will only need her glasses until she's about eight or nine, because these days, when we pick up a child who has a problem with their eye, we don't have to operate, as 20 years ago we always had to do. We now know that accurate treatment with simple glasses, usually just a plus three to plus four, very simple, will actually allow the child to get a sharp image onto the back of the eye and allow it to grow properly. And in this photograph, you'll all assume that the old lady is the patient, but sadly, the girl in the middle in the blue sari is the patient. And she, there she is walking into um, surgery. And she's about to have a 10-minute operation that is actually going to give her her sight back. Now, what sort of a life will she have now that she can see again? This is a very common sight across Africa. What you're looking at is one of the 12 million HIV orphans. And what happens when they become a HIV orphan? They have to be looked after by their grandparents. And in Africa, most grandparents are in their 40s. The average person in Malawi doesn't live beyond the age of 47. And this grandparent is blind with a cataract. Because over 50% of the world blindness due to cataract is in Africa. And in Africa, you've got at least 12 million people with severe blindness, like this man in his 40s, who simply can be cured with a simple operation. So the world isn't ideal at the moment, but I know we can change it. And what are the statistics? This is a WHO definition, a statistic for low vision and blindness. 316 million people. Now, let's look at that. 
because that letter A in a chart in my office, this is the normal Snellen chart, and if you come in and I test your vision, I usually ask you to stand six metres from the chart. And if you can only see the letter A, I tell you your vision is six over 60. And that is the legal definition of blindness in Ireland. But not, that's not the WHO definition. For the WHO definition, it's three over 60. You have to be twice as blind to fall into that statistic of 316 million. And the low vision refers to people who can only see the letters NTCO. That's 618. That's, if anybody can see better than that, it's considered an acceptable result. But you know what? In our country and in the developed world, you need to see the next line before you're allowed to drive a car. So even the statistics I'm talking about are the tip of the iceberg. 37 million people are blind, completely blind. And as I said to you, over half of those are blind because of cataract. So tonight, I'm going to briefly tell you about three things that can help eradicate this preventable blindness. One is development in the management of cataract, pioneered by Dr. Venkataswama in India, referred to earlier by Bill McDonough. And the other is what we can do about the glasses, and you already have a taster for that from what I've said. And then the third thing is just to be mindful of the up-and-coming condition that technology can now treat. Why did we have a crisis 20 years ago in blindness with cataract? Because it was a very difficult operation. It took us an hour and a half. I wasn't allowed near a cataract for about two years. Now, due to technology, our surgeon in ERISA is doing one every three minutes. This man here in this photograph is a technician in Malawi. And he can do an operation, you know, reasonably, he can do 10 a day, and that's great. And he is supervised by an ophthalmologist because technology has allowed us to use ultrasound, lots of different tricks and techniques that make it very doable. This is the system in India where they just swing a microscope. And this was developed by Dr. Venkataswama over 30 years in Aravind. But do you know what the best bit is? This whole eye health system pays for itself. It's, it's unique. When it comes to social enterprise, the actual cost of doing these procedures is also able to attract, attract something that will bring in an income. The operation itself in a high volume system costs between $10 and $20. But if you're offering glasses out that you can buy for a dollar in China, well, you know, somebody instead of their mobile phone might want a nicer pair of glasses. And we have proven in the Congo, for starters, that the income from that can actually pay for cataract surgery for the poor for free. And if you provide high quality in a low resource country, well then those who have stopped flying out of the country for services, they access it in the country. And as Dr. Van Kathaswam approved in India, that money will provide a service where those who have, have the identical procedures to those who don't, by the same people, in a less luxurious facility, uh, a more luxurious facility perhaps, and it covers the price. So it's a self-sustainable system. It's economically self-sustainable. This slide was taken about six months ago in Orissa. This is from a leprosy colony. I love this slide, actually. <laughs> They're all very cool. And all those patients could see 10, 15 minutes after their surgery, 80 operations in one day. Now, you don't always need to do high volume. This happened to be the need in that area, and it was one surgeon. But it's so doable. And what else is exciting about the time we're living in with technology? One of the great problems in countries like our, in, on the continent of Africa is retention of healthcare workers. And why should somebody who's educated live in the middle of nowhere? 75% of all the eye surgeons in Ethiopia live in Addis, in the city. And why shouldn't they? They want good things. They've studied. They've worked hard. But sadly, 75% of the population is living in the remote areas. And often the surgeons in remote areas will move into the cities to have access to education for their families. So what about the old Australian outback system? Well, again, with technology, we can actually create online communities using our colleagues in other parts of the world. And I'm involved with the development now of my colleagues in the American Academy of Ophthalmology, my colleagues in England, and is to form an online community to support, to share the good results, the bad results. But also, there's a school in Dublin that's now become interested in offering online education to the families, uh, ways of doing international exams, because people want to live beside their families. They don't all want to emigrate. I became involved with the computer science team here in Trinity College, and it occurred to me that the operation that we do now is so compact 
and it can be broken down into 12 simple stages. It's purely visual, non-tactile. It's like an Xbox game. It's exactly like a PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo game. So I went to Microsoft Xbox and I said, why not? So they introduced me to the skilled people here in Trinity College and um, we've done it. We've developed um, a free cataract surgery simulator. Now, simulators are used to train cataract surgeons around the world, but they cost $100,000. But with an online game, with our online community, we're going to be able to monitor, to help recruit people who've got the skill, but also have a lot of fun. And then we've got these new up-and-coming systems like Google Wave. Again, it's all about a community accessing, sharing information, sharing knowledge, because the techniques now have become so doable. And just a word on glasses before I finish. For want of glasses, can you believe this? 13 million ch children are blind. And you know, they say compassion is a unifying force. The ability to try and imagine what somebody else is feeling. Well, if you can imagine that, how can you not do something about it? And we are talking about glasses that will cost a dollar. 45 million people can't go to work because they don't have their glasses. Similar to the member of the Australian government who actually luckily got his glasses in time. But this is harrowing. 150 million people have to give up work, give up fine embroidery, give up jobs in the educational establishment in countries where they can't access reading glasses that we can all buy here in a sweet shop, but that we couldn't buy a few years ago. This is the time of change. 102 billion is the estimated cost to the economy of preventable blindness. Has any of you seen this? Well, I have a version in my office, and this is called an automatic refractor. And these have become widely available only in the last few years. And what does it do? Well, it's actually a walking, non-talking optometrist. You hold this up to somebody, my secretary does it, and it prints out the eye prescription. Now, we will always need very highly skilled optometrists for certain conditions. But I have to tell you, you do not need them to prescribe any of the glasses anymore. And the technology is quite simple. A light is shone into the eye, and the image that reflects backwards can be interpreted by the machine, based on our traditional methods for examining eyes. So why can't we do it with a mobile phone camera? And that's what we're now looking at here in the department that we've been developing the Xbox online game. And is any of you familiar with mobile phone penetration in the developing world? You know, 12 million hospital beds in Africa, 302 million computers in Africa. In Africa and Asia, 3 billion mobile phones and growing and growing. People would buy a mobile phone for $50 in the same country like Cameroon where it costs $10 for a cataract operation. You can use a modem, you can have wireless transmission. And how about this? A vending machine for mobile phones. Well, what about a vending machine where you put your chin into it and it looks back and prints out your prescription? And lo and behold, you've got your glasses, you know? We're talking about 316 million people. Well, it's doable and it's all happening now. It's going to happen. And the last word I'll tell you is, recent study in September said that glaucoma, which we didn't really know it was so bad, is responsible for a third of blindness in countries like Africa for genetic reasons. And that's a condition where you just need to put a drop in the eye to keep the pressure under control. But they could never get drops out to the patients in remote parts of Africa, and the drops cost a fortune. I came across the company that makes this machine in America a couple of weeks ago. There's only one of these in Ireland. This is cutting-edge technology. This is a laser that will laser the eye to eliminate the need for drops in a large percentage of these patients. I've already sent six of my patients and they've got off all their drops. I went to the company and I said, you have got to put this into Africa. We can't get the drops, we can't get it out there. And once somebody loses their sight from glaucoma, they don't get it back. The answer was, I grew up in Africa, the person heading up the company. And as of the next few months, we're starting off with three of these glaucoma centers. So this technology is going to skip everything we're at here. And these people will be accessing the solution, skipping all the drop surgery stages in between. So if you have any compassion, now knowing what I know, how can you not do everything in your power to try and influence global policy government policy, healthcare policy, to let everybody have their right to sight. Thank you.